Welcome. Great night for it. I think the, the rain has held off, but still quite humid, uncomfortably. My name's uh, Adam Jefford. I'm the Asia Pacific Design Library Manager, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. I'd like to commence by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the Turrbal and Yugara people, and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them and to the elders still living today. The location of the State Library on Karupa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people. We proudly continue that tradition here today. All right. I actually, I'm feeling a little old tonight. Uh, and I know I don't look old, but for the last 15 years, I've been teaching in high schools, Brisbane, Gold Coast, and I saw a student that I taught <laughs> about seven years ago here tonight, and he tells me that he is now in a firm, which I think is fantastic. Vince, I'm trying to embarrass you. Where are you? <laughs> oh, there you are. Thank you. Hi, Vince. <laughs> Great to see you. Um, and having said that, I, I've got to admit to you that I am petrified of talking to a room full of architects. My usual audience is Year 9 students, so you'll have to be a little kind to me. Uh, the series, it's a stalwart in the architectural events calendar, and we are fortunate to have the first two lectures of this series as part of the Asia-Pacific Architectural Forum. We think that this is a fantastic opportunity to hear from esteemed architects who are pushing boundaries in our region. We'd also like to thank our event partners, in particular the UQ School of Architecture, staff and students who have assisted us to deliver such a high calibre of programming. You might be aware of ArchiSpy. It's a little Instagram thing we do. We encourage you to go out there and take beautiful pictures of buildings, tag it, ArchiSpy. I would participate. My Instagram got hacked by Russians last week, so it's currently closed. Um, there was a lot of pictures there that I did get a message in the morning from my mother saying, uh, I think you need to check your Instagram and I won't show you the picture, but it was definitely not me. The other thing that they did was they, uh, they classified me as an athlete, which I thought was fantastic. <laughs> All right. Um, look, I have a little bit of housekeeping to do. The toilets are located on levels two and three and they're directly adjacent to the entry. In an emergency, please move to your nearest exits, down the stairs, and gather outside Goma, which is directly behind us. I hope your phones are on silent, but we would encourage you, of course, to use the hashtags that you can see on the screen in the bottom right-hand corner um, to tag the event tonight. We are filming this for Design Online. It is streaming on Facebook as well as a few websites right now and uh, there will be a recording of this event up in a couple of weeks as well for anybody that isn't able to join us tonight. Uh, you can also go to designonline.org.au for the reading notes, the transcripts, and also information about the CBT, CBT points for you. I would like to introduce Jane Cowell, our Executive Director for Engagement and Partnerships here at the State Library of Queensland. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Adam. Uh, and I too would like to pay my respects to uh, acknowledge traditional owners and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, Vicky MacDonald, our state librarian, uh, extends her apologies as she was not able to attend tonight, uh, and, but she wanted to, to me to convey our um, gratitude to the uh, School of Architecture from University of Queensland. Uh, as we're a very proud partner in this um, series of lectures. State Library is committed uh, to working in partnership to deliver intellectual, interesting programs for our audiences. And without um, such committed partners as um, University of Queensland, we wouldn't be able to deliver uh, these types of series. And um, I did ask Liz today, and uh, she tells me it's our fifth year. Is that correct? Yes, our fifth year of, of partnership. So, you know, sort of we've grown over that time and we've got better and better. And um, I think uh, this fifth year uh, uh, we'll see an amazing uh, series. Uh, I would like to um, also invite you all to experience our Asia Pacific Design Lounge on level two of State Library over the course of this series of lectures uh, and, and so that you can experience the resources, both online and physical, that we have. It's a curated collection that's selected just for um, design, architecture, 
fashion, all things design is in, in the collection. And please engage with our uh, Asia Pacific Design Library staff, uh, ably led by Adam, uh, to connect with the library. So we really do uh, invite you to really connect with us uh, as well through this series. So once again, thank you so much uh, to the School of Architecture and, and all of the work uh, that you do with our team to deliver this series, so thank you. Thank you, Jane. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Sandra Cargio grady who is the Dean of Architecture and Head of School at UQ. Thank you, Sandra. So this is a bit of an up and down bit at the beginning where we all thank each other. And so my job is to thank the library, of course, because we couldn't do this sort of event back on the peninsula it's really important for us to be in this cultural centre for this kind of occasion and to extend our um, resources out into the community in the way that the library makes possible. So for both the library and for us, we share the ambition of being a platform for intellectual discourse around design, for debate, for ideas, for inspiration. And this is a really lovely opportunity for us to come together to do that in a, in a shared and interesting way. I thank the audience because, of course, it's not possible to keep doing this without your enthusiasm. So every week we have fabulous people up on here, but we have great people out in the audience. And the conversations that we have beforehand and after are incredibly important for me and for all my colleagues, and also, I think, for our students. So make sure you come week after week and keep an eye on the tickets and the um, emails to you. I'd also um, like to thank Kelly Greenop, my colleague in the School of Architecture, because putting on a, a, a series of lectures like this takes a lot of effort and thought, thinking who should go in what order, who should we invite, and Kelly's done a fabulous job this year, as I'm sure you'll agree when uh, she comes up and talks about what's ahead. So thank you, Kelly, for all the effort that you've put in this year. We try and share the tasks, so um, you know, it's been different people each year, and that also keeps it very fresh. But thanks very much. I'm going to ask Kelly to come in and talk about, come up and talk about it. So. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge again the traditional owners of Kirilpa, the original name of this part of the city that we're in tonight, and express my gratitude for their millennia of caring for country where we're gathering right now. Tonight's a really exciting evening, the first in our eight lecture series for 2017, uh, beginning with a joint Asia-Pacific Architecture Forum event. The lecture series unfolding ahead of us is ostensibly curated by me and carries some of the interests I've long held, women in architecture, an architecture focused on um, housing and humans, and of course, beautiful buildings. But really, I've had a lot of help in choosing the speakers and managing to secure such a stellar lineup with some well-placed emails and email addresses from our colleagues. We have three international speakers in the series this year. We have Melissa Leando of Xotoris Leando uh, of Jakarta, Alexis and Murat Sanal of Sanal Ark, Istanbul, and tonight's speaker, Wenhui Lim of Spark, Singapore. But we also have more. We have some fresh local talent, the exuberant and innovative practices of Maytree Studios and Atelier Chen Hung, um, and they're performing in a sort of double header on emerging practice, which should be fantastic. We've got new academics and practitioners to our school, Muge Balek and Fred Fialo of UQ Architecture, and their practice F flat, very recently of Istanbul and now of West End. So they're coming to speak just before um, Easter. We've also invited some interstate colleagues to join us, of course. In two weeks, we have Jeremy McLeod from Breathe Architecture, and he's going to speak about, about the architect as developer model of Nightingale, which is the talk of Melbourne and is also currently keeping planning authorities there very busy. 
but it's attracting unprecedented interest. And he hasn't spoken in Brisbane before, so I'm sure that's going to be a really important and um, exciting lecture. So look out for when those tickets go uh, online in a couple of weeks. To complete the series, we've got Chris Welsh of Welsh and Major, who will be giving us a tour of some of her gorgeous heritage adaptive reuse projects and other Sydney projects. And we finish all the way off in May with William Smart of Smart Design Studios speaking about, amongst other things, his award-winning Indigo Slam project, um, which has been a real highlight of the past 12 months in architecture, especially in terms of awards. So what's the theme here? We've, got, we've had some wonderfully clever themes in the past that some of our colleague, my colleagues have managed to encompass the aims of the series. But to be honest, I had a fairly simple set of criteria. I wanted to bring in people whose passions were strong and evident in their design, whose desires to change or work at the edge or, or work intensely are really clear. So what you'll see is a collection of eclectic but excellent work. Um, from great practices from a wide range of settings and studios. Our collaborators in the Asia Pacific Design Library here at SLQ put this neatly as those pushing the boundaries in architecture at the moment, and I think that's really true. This also ties in, of course, with the regional boundaries being pushed into Asia with the APAF and tonight's speaker, Wen Hui Lin. Wen Hui is a director at Spark Architects who operate in Singapore and Shanghai and a little bit in London sometimes. After graduating from National University of Singapore, she spent two years working in a Singapore-based architecture practice uh, prior to joining Spark. She oversees the graphic identity of Spark Studios, as well as having parallel roles in design leadership and client liaison. Wen Hui is responsible for the conception of many of Spark's award-winning projects, including Phi Fa in Bangkok, Star Hill Gallery in Kuala Lumpur and Capital Land's Raffles City Ningbo in China. So please make her welcome. Hello. Good evening. Do you mind if I take a picture of you? <laughs> it's for my Facebook. Okay, one, two, cheers. Perfect, thank you. So perhaps best known for designing Clark Key in Singapore, um, Stephen and myself have been working in Asia for the past 17 years. Um, the projects that we are known for are um, Shanghai International Cruise Terminal. We also work a lot um, in China, designing raffle cities. So we have done about three, and one in Singapore as well. And um, some of the projects that we have built um, in India, in China, in the Middle East, uh, what you can see on the screen, um, they are in excess of about two million square meters. So the skill that we work with range from master planning huge city centers. This is in Abu Dhabi. Um, to designing handbags. Most of our work is located in mainland China. Um, some of the skill that we work with could be mind boggling. Just two months ago, we were working on a mixed use project of over half a million square meters, um, comprising of offices, service apartments, residential and shopping malls. One of the characteristics of working in China is the fast pace of construction and um, the very condensed design, design process. So this is, very, this is not uncommon to get a comment like this from the client. Please give me five ideas in a week. Or please, can you um, complete the design development in two weeks? By having worked in China for a long time, we have learned to dealt with it in a very positive light. So this is a typical um, design process that we go through, perhaps for the rest of the world, concept, schematic, and then you move on to detailed design, tender, and construction. But in China, sometimes they take your concept and go straight <laughs> to construction drawings. So this gets passed on to the contractor who then produces contractor drawings that you have, we have to check, and then it gets built. 
But of course, um, case in point, I'm going to show you a project that went through exactly that. So this is a sales gallery um, located in Nanjing. You can see this over here. So this is a new city quarter in the Nanjing South um, Railway Station. It's a high-speed rail. So the design process from start to finish took only about three months. We were appointed in August, and the building was finished by the beginning of December. Extraordinary. So by then, we have worked in China for about 12 years. So um, we knew what we had to do. We had to make quite efficient, quick decisions. We knew what materials were readily available in the marketplace. So we knew how much it was, they were going to cost so, and how they would turn out. So we started by considering, um, as any architect would do, um, the design of the building. So located, because of its location right next to the train station, we had to consider that the building will be perceived from a variety of scales and distance. So obviously, um, the passengers from the passing train will be looking at this building. So you will need to have quite a sculptured form, something interesting in the horizon and also people driving past and people walking from the train station. So to us, skill and perceiving this building from a variety of distance is quite important. So taking inspiration from the Taj Mahal, which is a sculpted form from a distance, and there is a filigree of, of um, detail as you move closer to it, we decided to um, use the moiré effect um, as a screen material. So the moiré effect is effectively the same pattern overlay on top of each other that creates a shifting pattern as you move around it. So it's a little bit like um, the LV facade that you may be familiar with. So it's constructed from aluminum panels, which is relatively cheap in the marketplace. So we did a lot of testing very intensively for a variety of scales, patterns, color. You can see my colleague looking very stressed. On the <laughs> and then quickly get it tested on site. So based on site samples, we decided um, what color to use and what scale the perforation should be. So design development drawings were quickly produced in a space of two weeks. And this is the finished result. So it's quite exciting for us that we get a call from the client, say, oh, you know, could you help us out with this project? And then suddenly, three months later, you have it ready for publication. So that is the excitement and challenge of working in China for us. So as you can see, the form is quite simple and sculptural, accentuated by this um, line of light in the evening. This is the facade facing the passing trains. So there is a big LED screen that um, advertises on the larger commercial development and the plaza in front of it. So because of this layering of um, the screen, the color sort of changes as you move around the building as well, which is what we quite like. So the next project I'm going to show you is of exactly the same scale about just under a thousand square meters, very small building, but it's in a different part of the world, in Bangkok, and um, of a very different nature and program. Phi Pha Pachautis is a community project. It's essentially um, the refurbishment of two shop houses to house a free school for underprivileged children. It's located um, in the Prachawudis district, about an hour's drive from Bangkok city center. This is what it looks like. This is not a cons conservation building. So we were free to do structural changes, facade changes to it. So this is just one unit. So imagine two of these units with the wall knocked down in between. So the client asked us to design a building um, for this project. The client is a TMB bank. They are not developers. 
they are doing this um, as a free, they are sponsoring the project because um, of their corporate social responsibility. They want to appear as, you know, not just about making money. Um, so they asked us to design this building. So we thought it would be a great idea if we could get the children from the community to contribute to the design process. So we held a number of workshops over a few weekends with the children to get to conjure um, some ideas of what they would like um, to have in their school. So it's been a very, very re rewarding process. Well, architects um, tend to be a little bit boring and after a while, you know, we are always wearing black. We are worried about using colors in buildings. Children are not afraid to express what they think and they draw uh, whatever they like. So there are some great ideas in some of the drawings that we translate into the building elements. Nice colors in the, in the building and then having the name of the project on the facade, having a screen, it's just not encumbered by all the baggage that we adults have. So this is the finished result. You can see all the colors coming through from the interiors of the building. The name of the building, Fai Fa, which means light. So is this like the light of the community? <clears throat> so this is what it looks like in the daytime. So this graphic um, for the screen was made into a t-shirt for the volunteers of the school. So the people who teach in the school, they are staff from the bank who contributes their time to work there and also volunteers from the community. So everybody had a part to play in this project. Even the landlord um, of the shop house, they gave this FIFA school 10 years of free rent, which is great. So the circulation through the building is organized with this yellow root, circulation route, which is like Dorothy's um, break, yellow brick road in the Wizard of Odds. It connects all the programs across the levels of the building, including um, an exhibition port for the children's artwork, which sits at the ground level, and a utility stick that plugs into the back of the shop house which houses all the um, toilets and new services. So each level is very simple. It's got different programs. So there's a library, there's a dance studio, an art class, and a garden at the roof of the building. So this project has been heavily published. It's a great story about the community, architects involving um, children, client, and everybody um, doing their part in the community. And um, it was nominated for the Aga Khan Award a few years ago, which was great um, testament to this effort. So the plans, as you can see, is very, very simple. This is a very low budget project but simple but effective. So you can see the yellow staircase being the wayfinding um, signage for the children. The image on the left is the library and then the art class on the right. So now, um, Fi is oversubscribed, especially on the weekends. The classes are always full. Um, the staff who volunteer have great time working there. So you get these great images every week from the school, which is nice for us. So this project, um, I mean, we work on many big commercial projects across Asia, and this is easily one of the smallest projects, but I can say in my years at Spark, this is one of the most enjoyable process. Here's a kid looking happy at FIFA. So, we like to think um, about the cities that we live and work in, and I'm from Singapore. When we were working um, on Clark Key in Singapore, which is by the Singapore River, this is the Singapore River in the 1800s, we did a lot of research on the Singapore River. So 
Singapore River used to be where the lifeblood of Singapore is. It's the hub of commerce and trade. So you can see there are lots of bum boats um, in the image. It's where the boats bring in the um, goods from the docks into the warehouses at Clark Key, where they are then distributed to the rest of the city. But with rapid urbanization of Singapore in the 60s and 70s, Singapore River was cleaned up, and along with it, all the activities on the river um, is gone, it's moved to the edges of the city. Effectively, um, urbanization has caused the city to turn its back from the river. So we would like to think that we could do something to reanimate the riverfront and the water body. Now in parallel, we love eating in Singapore. This is um, Maxwell Food Center for those of you who have been. It's a typical hawker center in Singapore. Singapore is a great gathering place for cuisine around the region. Um, I'm sure you've heard of like food like chicken rice, cha kwe tiao. I mean, we love our food. There's even a term coined for the food culture in Singapore. It's called the makan culture. Makan is the Malay word for eating. I mean, we love our food so much. Some say that even our landmark buildings look like food. <laughs> you know, Esplanade and even the new building by Thomas Hedewig looks like dim sum. But believe it or not, the hawker trade is a dying trade in Singapore. Um, traditionally, a family business handed down to the, from parents to their children. Um, the younger generation is not taking up this trade because of long hours with little reward. And then there is the competition from fast food like KFC, McDonald's, Pizza Express. So we thought it's quite important that um, we try to do something about this. Another thing is hawker food is a very local thing. You seldom see tourists in um, hawker centers. So we thought, why not bring, provide a platform for the hawker trade to be on an international platform, plus um, animate the waterfront in Singapore. So we brought two ideas that are not usually being combined in the new idea that we call the solar orchid. So it's essentially um, a floating hawker center that occupies um, the riverfront in Singapore at Clark Key, at Boat Key. So tourists can get a taste of um, our Makan cuisine. It's basically to celebrate our culture. So this is what it looks like. It's a modular system that could be combined in many ways. That's what it looks like on plan. So each pot can seat about 80 people, or it could be, um, yeah, it can be configured. So when this uh, configuration plugs back into land, all the services, that's where all the services and maintenance is done. The roof of the solar orchid is um, made from ETFE, which is the same material as in Clark Key. It's clad with thin film photovoltaic cells, so it generates, it collects solar power and generates energy for cooking. There's also rainwater collection, and then the waste is then collected at the base of the port, and when this solar orchid plugs back into land, its servicing is being done. So there are many opportunities for the solar orchid to manifest its presence in Singapore. There are many beautiful water bodies. And as I said, because it's a modular system, you can have a really big floating hawker center or really and configured in many different shapes to suit the location. It could be located at Gardens by the Bay. And the orchid is a national flower of Singapore, so we thought it's quite appropriate that it forms the orchid, shape of the orchid. This is Changi, Changi Beach, Boat Key. It could animate the Marina Bay and used to celebrate many festivals in Singapore, National Day. And um, some of you may know there is this um, day called the Singapore Day that Singaporeans celebrate 
uh, all around the world. Um, so we thought the solar orchid could be a branding for Singapore, perhaps in London, on the River Thames, or in Manhattan. This has been a fun and great project for us, and um, we won an award for it two years ago um, in China by Fast Company. We are the only architectural practice to win this creative award. Right now, the solar orchid um, has gone out to the marketplace and is in development. We have uh, garnered a lot of interest around the world, including in Sydney and um, in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. This is the second project that I'm going to show you um, for this loosely defined research that we've done for Singapore. Um, this was done specially to celebrate Singapore's 50th year of independence. It's about reimagining public space. Orchard Road is currently the main shopping boulevard in Singapore. A lot of people don't know this because this heritage and history has been forgotten, but in the 1800s, Orchard Road used to be a really beautiful nutmeg plantation with lots of fruit orchards. It's a place to relax for people to have a stroll. Um, but as our urbanization happened, um, this Orchard Road has gone through a series of transformation um, to housing a graveyard, a market, some commercial shop houses, and currently it's a massive traffic avenue that's lined with big shopping centers. Orchard Road has turned into a place for cars and lost its memory of um, being a beautiful nutmeg plantation. So our vision is to reimagine Orchard Road and hope that by the time Singapore celebrates our 100th year of um, independence, Orchard Road will be an orchard for people returning to its roots. So this is what it looks like at the moment, full of barriers occupied by a four-lane um, roadway that splits the pedestrian to both sides of the road. And there are lots of um, preambulations of the, of the city. You can see signages, um, trash bins, barriers. And this is what we imagine it to be, a park where people can relax, have a stroll, have a picnic. It has a cycling path, a nice environment where people can hold events and gather. So there are a number of devices that um, we thought about when we work on this project. So you can see very clearly um, on the left, it's a diagram of Orchard Road at the moment. Traf is a Traffic is the primary focus, people are secondary. And on the right is what we hope to achieve by putting a canopy over the street and moderating the climate and taking away the cars, perhaps to underground or removing it entirely. We reduce, improve the air quality and um, have multi-level spaces for people. So this is a three-dimensional diagram illustrating um, what I just said. Can't see it. So I think it's important that the Orchard Road is now occupied um, with a lot of public space. It's, this is a length of about um, 1.2 kilometers. So it could be curated in many different ways, exhibitions, art, F&B, entertainment, and um, lots of fruit orchards can go into this space as well. Well, as you know, with uh, e-commerce, um, the role of the shopping mall has decreased. We hope that um, with this uh, rebranding of Orchard Road, a new public space can bring the footfall back to this location again. So Orchard Road was previously divided into two, down the middle by the road. Um, with this new proposition, people are connected on multiple levels, not just the ground where the park is, but in the underground, which is connected to the infrastructure, the metro. We have um, um, a variety of functions. It could be 
healthcare in the future. It could be exhibitions or more food and beverage. This is the current threshold condition into Orchard Road, which is, um, you know, the city center. It's a gigantic um, um, traffic junction. You sort of have to hold your life in your hand when you cross the road. Why not have a place of celebration, you know, for people? This is in another part of Orchard Road. If you're lucky, you can cross the road um, maybe after 200 meters of walking down its length at the moment. So it should really be connected at any one point along this street. So this summarizes what we think is important for this um, landmark destination of Singapore. Take away the cars, create public space, um, bring back the heritage of the place, um, and of course, make money in the process. And the environmental aspect of it is quite important. We work with um, an environmental engineer on how to cool down the space and generate um, better climate, control the climate. This could be Southeast Asia's largest solar array. We put a canopy over Orchard Road. I mean, it's easily um, 100 meters by two kilometers long. So this generates enough power from the PV cells on the canopies to power the fans beneath it and to cool down the temperature by more than five degrees Celsius. I mean, Singapore is like Brisbane, it's very humid. You can't take away the humidity, but you can make the environment more comfortable by you know, creating a gentle breeze down the street. And um, right now, all the shopping malls, air-conditioned shopping malls, generate a lot of uh, condensate from the air conditioning. So our idea is to collect the, air con uh, the condensate and put it into um, pools within the street so it evaporates and creates cooling. There is also a new reservoir that we propose underneath um, the street. Um, Orchard Road floods a lot, so we need this piece of infrastructure to stop the flooding, to help the flooding. Now, Beach Hut is another of our research project. Um, this is quite interesting because it combines two ideas again. One is about the reuse of ocean waste, recycling ocean waste. And the other is about animating the coastline of Singapore. We got this idea because it came to our attention that people like Adidas, they are making shoes out of ocean plastic, plastic collected from the ocean. And uh, some of you may know this, that um, G-Star Raw, which is a fashion brand, um, partially owned by Pharrell Williams, the American pop star, they also um, recycle ocean plastic and make it into clothes, very fashionable clothes. The waste is collected from the oceans and then is made and processed into this uh, material called the bionic yarn, which is then woven into textiles. So you can see really fashionable clothing. Both Adidas and Pharrell Williams, they work with this pressure group called Pale for the Oceans. So what Pale does is um, they raise awareness about marine life and cleaning up the oceans. So they're basically speaking up for um, the oceans where nobody else is. So what Pale is saying is that we have produced enough plastic in this world uh, we don't need to be making more. We should be recycling all of them. Um, you know, all the waste and uh, litter that people throw into the oceans, they get swiftly swept into these big ocean current systems called the gyre. So you can see on the screen that um, the most famous ones, perhaps, called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This patch is so big. Um, if you can read it up on Wikipedia, is twice the size of Texas. 
ocean garbage um, does not disintegrate or degrade. Like you can read on the screen, disposable diaper only degrades after 450 years. And a glass bottle probably never. All these um, plastics or trash, um, microscopic or huge, gets mistaken for food by marine life and birds, seabirds. So this is quite a common sight. The key thing about this is that it goes into the food chain, which means that all of us here eating seafood is ingesting plastic as well. So this is quite a pertinent issue that we should all be aware of. I mean, these facts and figures. So our idea is why leave it to people like Adidas and um, G-Star Raw to do something about it? We can do something about it. What are architects and designers doing about it? So we thought that we could collect this ocean plastic, wash and shred them, and reform them into architectural building material. So in parallel, Singapore, being an island nation, just like any other, gets lots of plastic and trash um, washed up on its beaches every day. We rely a lot on the maritime trade for our GDP. You can see all the trading boats and ships on the horizon. So it is very relevant to us to clean up the oceans. So we thought, why not turn the ocean plastic into something wonderful for Singapore to animate our coastline? And all the kids, all the young people in Singapore, they um, like to spend time on the beach in tents, to maybe um, spend, spend some time with their friends, get away from their parents. So we thought um, it could be good if we can make temporary accommodation out of these uh, recycled plastic. So there we go, third generation beach hut on the right. So the Spark Beach Hut has a very small footprint on the beach. It's elevated for a great vantage point towards the ocean. So you swipe your credit card and then a drop letter falls and lifts you up to a room. This is naturally ventilated. It could be open. Um, it could potentially be um, laminated with thin film photovoltaic. So that will power the fence inside the beach hut. The components are quite simple and straightforward. There's recycled concrete um, with a very simple lightweight frame. And then the shingles, which is made of HPDE2, recycled plastic, goes on top of it. It could be curated in many different ways and colors. So they're yeah, essentially pieces of urban furniture sitting on the coastline in Singapore. And they are like lanterns, beautiful lanterns in the evening. East Coast Park um, in Singapore is all reclaimed land. So all these are artificial and did not, did not exist 30 years ago. Singapore did so much landfill that we grew from about 500 square kilometers to nearly 800 square kilometers. That's how artificial our coastline is. So we are very happy that um, the Beach Hut won an award at the World Architecture Festival last year in the future and experimental category. What's important for us is that these issues um, start conversations, I mean the design starts conversation in the design community, within our studio, and among other um, pressure groups, other professionals. And um, this is the second year in running that we win this award. The year before in 2015, we won the same category for our project Spark Home Farm, which is about aged care living. So I'm going to show you one more project 
Um, we do build projects sometimes. So this is um, an urban project, urban proposition in the South China city of Shenzhen, Shekou. Well, this is quite a large project. It's about 70,000 square meters. It has an office tower and a shopping mall that is open air. So what's interesting is that um, it sits on top of a metro station and it has a bus terminal at the ground level. So essentially, it's a collection of city infrastructure and a hub for people to move around. So even though this project has got quite a big area, it has a very porous footprint on the site, which allows people from the adjacent plots to move into the center of this development. So unlike, unlike a traditional shopping mall, which is an enclosed box, um, this project is layered in many different ways. The pavilions allow for lots of open-air terraces and courtyards that break down the scale of the shopping mall. So you have a sunken courtyard that welcomes people from the metro and a level two courtyard that sits on top of the bus station. So it's not work. Oops. Oh, I can't see it. So what's important for us is that other than being very permeable in its planning, um, it's very human skill and easy for people to navigate. This is one of the uh, rendered views of um, the view when you come out from the metro station of the sunken courtyard. And this is what, it like, what it's like when it's finished. It was taken about six months ago. So you can see the project is very permeable, the building is very permeable. You can see the underground uh, metro connection in this image. And at ground level, it's very open to the streets. This is a view from the street level. Because we design the architecture and the interior design, landscape design, wayfinding, it's important for us that the design language is carried through all aspects of the project. So the facade and the landscape is of the same design language. So this is a view taken from the streets in the evening. So with this quote from Dante, I end my presentation. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Wenhui. That was wonderful. Uh, great to see so many projects. As you know, if you've come along before, we don't take questions from the audience because that's a whole nother kettle of fish. But instead, we have a much more interesting concept where we invite a discussant on board to um, interview our speaker for this evening. So we welcome back to the stage Sandra Kajio grady our head of school, as well as Wen Hui and her um, co-director of Spark, Stephen Pimbley. So welcome and we'll hear from them. Thank you, that was fabulous. What I really enjoyed about the presentation was the variation in scale, but also motivation. So we saw projects which were commercial and quick. We saw projects which were uh, clients with a social motivation, where you're working closely with the user group. We saw projects which were research and speculative. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the relationship between those different types of projects particularly with the final, final quote about the spark. So in what way do your research projects feed into the built work? So some of the research projects, and I'm thinking here about the home farm. So the home farm, if I'm correct, and I might not be, 
began as a research project or as a kind of research idea, which was that elderly housing combined with urban farming might solve a couple of things together. It might keep uh, retired people busy and feeding themselves and it might also green the city. So it was a, was it a, it was a research idea which looks like it might get built. Is that correct? You're asking me. Yeah, either of you. So is that an example where a research project has led to a real project? Or was it always a real project? We hope so. It may become a real project. It did become a real project, then it stalled again. But um, to take one step back, before I arrived in Asia, I worked a lot uh, in the UK and London, and in particular, I worked for two practices, Richard Rogers, when I graduated, and then with Will Allsop for a long time. And we worked a lot on community projects and um, learned this process of sort of engagement with the community. Lots of architects are sort of terrified by that, going out there, sort of prostrating themselves and not being an arrogant person, which most mm. architects bloody well are. They're really arrogant and don't like engaging with the community. And you find if you do engage with the community, it's adding a lot of value to the process. Mm. You can learn an awful lot if you're not too fixed upon your ideas, like the FIFA process mm. was you know, a great heartwarming exercise because the children effectively designed the building for us, or we used their ideas and played it back to the client. Um, so before I arrived in Asia, I had a sort of background in sort of working with projects of that sort of nature. And um, I suppose Home Farm was born out of that, an interest mm. in working with the community and trying to do something for them. And, um, you know, healthcare projects in particular, they're pretty sort of turgid, really. Most hospitals you go into, you cross the threshold and they make you feel instantly ill mm -hmm. or worse than you do. And the sort of modern movement buildings, the crossing the threshold, they're full of light and air, wonderful experiences, you feel better. So I suppose using that as an example, an aged care living facilities, you know, we've all got experience of grandmothers or older relatives being sent away to these terrible places to spend their last few days. Desperate places, actually. So there's a concern for that, and I suppose people are living longer. Mm. Healthcare is getting better, which is great. Um, but dementia is the disease that's about to affect all of our lives, I think. So placing people in an environment where they can have better cognitive functions rather than being on their own is a concern as well. So home farm has come from lots of different directions. And like a number of the projects that Wenwei explained to you, uh, described, home farm has another element to it, which is gardening. And gardening not in the sense of growing flowers, um, that lots of people like doing, they like gardening. My mother, my grandmother like gardening. But Home Farm is about market gardening, so it's providing a resource, an income for the people who live there. So they're part of a community, which is great. They're not placed outside the city, they're inside the city. And they're not away from their families, they're with their families. So it stimulates those cognitive functions and keeps them active. So that's the great benefit of something like Home Farm. And, um, it was a research project, as you suggested, um, built out of those initial ideas. And um, we sort of took it um, to the authorities in Singapore. Of course, everybody really likes it, they love it. But they say, we want somebody else to pay for it. Mm. They're not prepared to engage with it. They just present you with all the problems. Well, aren't the neighbors going to steal the vegetables? What happens when you get infestation of blah, blah, blah? And you think, Jesus Christ, grow up. This is a big idea. Somebody's going to take this idea on board and they'll build it. And, you know, and then somebody else will build it. That's what's mm. required. In, yeah. We've all experienced that as architects. Until somebody does it, until somebody designs a great atrium in a hotel, nobody's done it before. Now, big atriums in hotels. So we took it around, uh, no success at all. And it's quite demoralizing in mm. a way. Uh, but we kept at it and it was published a lot, it won the award that you saw, and then a healthcare provider who's got this sort of heart in the right place, rather than a developer's perspective, decided that they wanted to engage us to build it, which was great. And then the ring it crashed. Mm -hmm. So that project's on hold at the moment. But um, there's been an awful lot of interest in it from all around the world, from Taiwan, other places around Japan, of course. Mm. 
So somebody will build it because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it has the right messages to it. We need to take old people seriously. We need to engage them in the community and give them something to do and give them self-esteem. So, as I said, it's got the right messages. So we're confident that somebody will build it. It's quite possible they already have. So given your drawings have been published, they've quickly documented mm, yes. and built it. Well, lots of developers yeah. in Singapore have stolen some of the ideas, yeah. but they provide gardening as a sort of hobby. Yeah. You mm. know, okay, you can have your little allotment and you can play at gardening, but it's not really taking not the systematic. ideas seriously. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, we had an opportunity to design um, a spin-off of Home Farm in Scotland, which is a garden shed, a little bit like Home Farm, that is attached to an aged care facility. But, you know, projects don't get built for all kinds of reasons. It was supposed to get um, European funding, and then Brexit mm. happened. <laughs> I, I, think, I think gardening in Scotland would be very challenging. <laughs> very cold. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the way the practice operates? So you've got some very impressive directors with really rich experiences and ambitions. Can you talk a little bit about how you work with them, um, what kind of motivations they're bringing to the practice? It's very clear what the two of you are bringing to the practice and what uh, you found the most stimulating. I, th I think when you said how it was satisfying it was to work with the children. How, what about everybody else? Can you talk, tell us a little bit about them? I th you never really know where an idea comes from, yeah. I don't think. I mean, you can think about it and think, well, how did I get that idea? You never quite know where the genus of an idea mm. is. Uh, for Home Farm, it came from reading an article in a, you know, one of those highbrow magazines like Wired or Newsweek that you mm. only ever read when you're on a plane because you can't afford to buy them. <laughs> and the headline was, you know, diapers for adults are outselling diapers for children in Japan. And you think, God, that's an awful idea. And you don't do something about it. You think, go back to your day job, you don't need to worry about it, but it stays with you. Yeah. And maybe we carry that idea around for maybe three, four months before we said, well, actually, maybe we should do something about it. Yeah. But then, how do you do it? What do you pair it with? And I can't remember who said, well, maybe we should do gardening as well. But it's a conversation mm. that goes mm. on about juggling with different thoughts, particularly with sort of research projects. And that's the sort of start, I mm. suppose. You never quite know where it comes from and how it's going to take shape, mm. but uh, being prepared to put the ideas on a table, um, I suppose, is quite important. Mm. Stephen, you're not answering the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nodding. But <laughs> tell, tell, tell us about how Thanks. each of the people have come on board and who they are. You can um, answer that then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've all got different roles to play. I mean, when you have a business, the most difficult thing is about recognizing what our skill sets and strengths mm -hmm. are and working together on it. So right now we have another director who is um, focusing on business development mm -hmm. and focusing on China. Mm -hmm. She is based in our Shanghai office. So we all have quite different um, responsibilities mm -hmm. to play. So there's no, not much fighting going on. It's you know, <laughs> and the rest of the team is set up um, with very clear roles to play. You're a project architect or you're a designer or your support team. It's quite clear. I mean, you know, there are roles and responsibilities. Is that what you are Yeah, asking? okay. Mm. Um, I thought you might tell us a little bit about the individual directors, mm. um, how you knew them, you know, how do you build up trust, how, um. do, you, how do you invite them on board? They're quite a diverse bunch. There are only three directors. Oh, I, th I, th I was um, thinking of the right. associates, I guess, that oh. are listed on your website. Okay. Yes, yeah. um, we have a number of associates who've been with us quite a long time, actually. And I suppose that's the trick, to encourage them as they start as quite young architects mm. in the practice and give them a responsibility, I suppose, as I was given when I first started, thrown in at the deep end mm. to sort of run projects. And that's really the only way that you learn. And as you will have seen, not that we showed a lot of it, but lots of very large, quite complicated mixed-use projects. And the largest at the moment is in Ho Chi Minh City, which is about 200,000 square meters. And we've got quite a sort of mid-30s, mm -hmm. Hong Kong Chinese, 
guy running that, and it's the first project of that size that he's run. And he's got his own team. You know, we have daily conversations about it, but ostensibly, he's in charge of that project. And you can see the individual growing mm. with the experience that you get. Mm. And it's quite complex. Um, lots of overseas consultants working on it. So, you know, you're juggling with lots of information and lots of demands from a big commercial client at the same time that puts a lot of pressure on the team. As you'll have seen from the sort of um, statement, you know, it's not just in China that says, give me five facade designs in a week, but um, clients in Southeast Asia as well are very demanding of the design team and what they expect. You know, they can change their mind quite quickly about what they want and often use the design process to decide what they want to do. So it's mm. design-led, which is a little bit dangerous but um, you know they're finding their way in the marketplace mm. just as we're finding our way through the design. So we do a lot of testing for them very quickly. Mm. And that presents a lot of pressure, I think, for the architects working on the projects. Going back to what Sandra asked about Spark. Mm. I mean, this is my 11th year working with Spark. And the reason I joined this practice in the first place was because of this um, high level of energy and creativity and fun that Spark proje mm. projects exude. You know. So in recent years, when we start to um, have these um, research projects, it sort of forces you to challenge typical typologies. And then you know, what else can be done um, for the cities that we live in? You know what we have or what was given a brief is always not enough. Mm -hmm. So you know we're always um, reacting, uh, you know, in a way to the briefs that were given by our client, um, or to circumstances or news that we read on the on the internet. And this sort of energy is something that keeps us going, and um, that sort of attracts like-minded individuals, mm -hmm. I think, in the firm. So our associates, our directors, they all believe in the same. They all have the same sort of attitude. I guess. Yeah. And they've got very mixed experience as well. Lots of them have studied in a variety of places, Europe, Asia, Australia, yeah. America. Yeah. So it's very much a melting pot of not just different I nationalities, mean, but different experiences. Yes, we, we don't have a big studio, maybe about 40 people in Shanghai and Singapore, but at one point we have 16 different nationalities yeah. working with us. So you get this very interesting hybrid of working styles and cultures. Yeah. Could you tell us a little, you talked about the a spark exuding this um, image of fun, but one of the things that I get from the work is the incredible optimism, and some of it seems to gel in my mind, and I could be completely wrong here, it could be just fantasy, which is something to do with Singapore, and Singapore's can-do attitude, you know, we've got a too small island, oh, we'll just make it bigger, you know, we just, we don't have any water, oh, we'll pump it in from here, so there's always been this, um, sense that you can create whatever environment you need to satisfy you, regardless of what the natural environment has presented. And some of that is evident in the work I see coming out of Singapore. It's like, oh, we, you know, the population's getting this large. Well, we're going to need to design apartments that will do this. And, and the ambitions are, are really very impressive and are probably at a quite different scale to... Um, some smaller practices working in Australia where that, you know, they're constantly facing planners who are very constraining and a, a kind of government si a policy situation which is very constraining. Do you feel that Singapore is receptive to the ambitions that architects have? How supportive is the, is the state? I think it's easier to answer that question if you're not Singaporean. Singaporeans tend to moan about everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not not me. <laughs> well, yeah, that, this is why I wanted to, you know, this is actually to see what the difference in your experience and that attitude here is. Uh, to yeah. sort of be a little bit anecdotal mm. in the answer. Um, I heard Lee Kuan Yew speak, Mr. Lee, the sort of founding father of Singapore, um, quite a long time ago, maybe 12 years ago, when they just kicked off the Gardens by the Bay project, this extraordinary mm. sort of in public investment in this mm. wonderful infrastructure for people, this new garden. It's like going back to Victorian times. It's only the Victorians that built extraordinary mm -hmm. gardens and they've coughed up, you know, billions of dollars mm -hmm. to make this amazing facility. You ever go to Singapore, you've got to go, it's wonderful. 
Um, he was talking at the sort of inauguration of the competition for the project, which we entered, but we didn't win. Um, and he said, when Singapore sort of um, broke the shackles of imperialism, as I often say, <laughs> and sort of extricated itself from the Malaysian Federation, Singapore was broke, mm. didn't have any money, didn't have any water. And um, he said the only thing they could afford to do at that time was to plant trees. So they did. Sorry? So they did. So they did, yeah. Mm. They planted a lot of trees, and it sort of gave this sort of... Uh, veneer to the cities being this sort of great bucolic, uh, bucolic paradise. Mm. So the route from the airport was planted with rain trees into the city and you come in, you fly into the airport, I don't think it was Changi at that point, but you know the avenue and people think, businessmen think, wow, never seen a landscape city like this before, mm. they must have pots of cash, this must be the great place to set up my headquarters and mm. lots of them did. And that was the birth of this sort of great economic miracle of mm. Singapore in Southeast Asia. So, yes, there is this extraordinary can-do attitude mm. about reclaiming land, making the city in a garden, and making this extraordinary place for people to live. But the Singaporeans love to moan about it. The trains don't work or this or that. But it has this attitude. Um, I'm not so sure how great it is as a sort of centre for design, although there are extraordinary architects like your Chun, who mm. works in Singapore. And there are lots of very talented people who tend to sell their wares overseas more mm. successfully, perhaps, as we do, than uh, just in Singapore. But I suppose that's rubbed off on me a little bit, this attitude in Singapore, that there is this possibility. Mm. Even though when you go to the agencies, they're a little bit, um, maybe we can't do that, the Singaporean attitude. Can't do that because nobody's done it before. Does it really work? Mm. But they'll get over that, and somebody will do it, and they'll grapple with it and they'll build it mm. because once they decide to do something they do it very quickly and they do it very well and that's the other great thing about Singapore and like most of its sort of Asian neighbors they build things with a degree of quality mm. in Indonesia and Malaysia and other areas of Southeast Asia the Finnish quality is rubbish actually mm. but in Singapore it's very good so it's mm. great to build there actually. Mm. let's hear from you <laughs> Well, I have been to a conference in Singapore where a speaker, developer, said design is the least important thing in the construction process. And there were murmurs of agreement in the crowd, in the audience. Well, it is difficult yeah. being in this profession. You have to recognize that sometimes it's hard for people to see the value of design and understand it particularly very practical Chinese business people in Singapore. Mm. They're all like middle-aged. And Singapore and Southeast Asia, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Southeast Asia is dominated by Asian businessmen, mm. middle-aged. Who needs partners? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we have to carry on. We have to be passionate mm. about what we believe in, you have to stay optimistic. Otherwise, you might as well just give up. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and it, I, you know, I think, your, say, your home farm project, if you talk it enough and publicize it enough, which you're clearly very good at, mm -hmm. at doing the, the media branding of, that, of the business, eventually it will happen because it will, it will, it will be sort of normalized and mainstreamed and, and familiar to people, even though it's never been constructed. Yeah, I think... This, um, is, the, this is the strategy, is it? We used to have a non-exec director who was one of my, used to be one of my bosses, the Richard Rogers and Partners, who was the sort of financial brains behind the business, yeah. whose name is Marco Goldschmidt. Quite a terrifying individual. I had to be scared to death of him when I used to work there. <laughs> but he says, you know, you need to take ownership of the process. And he's become an architect stroke developer. Yeah. And what we'd like to do, perhaps, is to invest in a project like this yes. and take somebody out of the equation. Yeah. That we design it and you do it yourself. Maybe not on the scale that we've shown it, but you know, other projects like the Solar Orchid, you, know, you need to invest in it or the Beach Hut. You need to have the cash and invest it and do it and show people yes. what it's like. Yes, you could start producing those Beach Huts. Yeah. That might be a, an easier one to get yeah. going than the... A home farm. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. That's been really, 
lovely to hear you both now um, talking about the practice and we're here especially for showing us the work um, in your lecture. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I just want to remind you that next week, if you already have tickets, we've got Melissa Leando coming to speak, and that's, of course, part of the Asia-Pacific Architecture Forum. There's lots of other events on, so go and have a look at the APAF website, and we hope to see you all next week. <laughs>